Well, welcome uh, to our session here. Um, bite off more than you can chew and chew it. We're going to talk about uh, and have a discussion about different OpenStack deployment methodologies and all that that entails. Uh, the format of this, what we're going to do is a uh, open Q&A. So at any point in time you have a question, come up to one of the mics so that way it gets on the recording and go ahead and ask. And in the meantime, we'll continue along with our, uh, with our subjects. So first round of introductions. My name is Tyler Britton. I work for Red Hat. Uh, my name is Kenneth Hoy. I work at Rackspace. And my name is Paul Tchaikovsky. I work for IBM. So uh, I think the first place we should start to kind of level set is the different consumption models for OpenStack, right? So there's not just one way to use it. There's different products and, and, and ways to deploy it. So I think um, you know, we could start off at the um, least, um, the end with least assistance, so DIY. So what's, what's DIY? Uh, so I guess usually for DIY, you've got, your, uh, you've got an operations team, you've probably got some uh, good Python developers, and you're like, we're going to roll our own OpenStack. Uh, and then you may choose to start with a, an existing distro, like uh, Red Hat, or uh, Canonical, or SUSE, or whatever, and use their packages and just sort of put together the architecture and uh, get all the software installed and configured uh, yeah. sort of on your own. Yeah, and I think t typically what I find with uh, folks that decide they go on the do-it-yourself approach is they have some very specific use case where they decide even um, what the OpenStack communities put out isn't quite the right fit, and they'll actually go in and modify the code and add on, add on features that it's not part of the community release, um, which then they maintain. So, so you mentioned uh, distros, which is one way you can get it, which usually it's from your Linux vendors, Red Hat, SUSE, Ubuntu, just like they do with Linux, we take the code, package it up, and, and have packages and releases uh, of OpenStack that we may, you may code individually um, by version numbers and things like that, uh, as well as there are some not, like for example, Mirantis also has a uh, OpenStack distribution uh, that they bundle together, and that's where you get your support from, right? So now, that's that first layer where you have someone to call if something breaks. Um, and the next level after that's managed, and there's a couple different ways to do that. So I don't know, Ken, you want to talk yeah, about it? Yeah, so the whole idea of managed OpenStack is um, basically customers who go, I, uh, this is not my core competency. Um, and rather than my having to learn how to do this, I'm just going to pay someone else to do it. Uh, so a couple of companies like Rackspace, IBM, um, Cisco, for example, have what, uh, what they call it a managed OpenStack or private cloud as a service where they may be using a distribution or the community code, but they are doing the day-to-day -day operations of that, um, of that platform. And ba the idea is you just should be able to just consume it like, the, like you would, a say, a public cloud where you don't actually have to do upgrades and things like that. And that's in, for the foreseeable future, right? So you just pay, pay every month and you get OpenStack. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, so that's a fast changing area. So tr uh, most of the folks like Rackspace and Cisco and IBM, um, their approach is we'll just keep managing this up all the way through all the various upgrades. Um, there are some companies, for example, like Morantis, who's started to do a what they call the built operate transfer model, where they, well, they'll deploy and operate for a year, and then you take it over. Um, and there are good and bad, uh, but which we'll talk about with that model as well as the other models. Yeah. So th and there's one more there where there's the concept of a partially managed OpenStack too. So there's. Uh, companies like Platform Nine, where they're managing the OpenStack bits, the control plane, but you, as the as the as the user, still has to have to manage the underlying hypervisor and, and things like that. So they're just managing the OpenStack bits and updating that and, and things like that. But operationally, you're responsible for that. So there's there's all these different ways to consume OpenStack. So we've kind of hit the high level of what those options are. And if there's not any questions, we'll go into kind of why you would start. Choosing one so of those ways. actually, what might be interesting is um, if the, for the folks in the room who are actually who are deployed have deployed OpenStack in their companies, uh, how many of you are do, like rolling your own OpenStack? Okay, how many of you are doing a distribution from a vendor, and how many of you are letting someone else manage it for you? Okay, so it's, so it's mostly roll your own actually. Um, we got a question. Yeah, so on the um, when you're rolling your own, 
as far as like hosting, what's the integration requirement for like a rack space so that way we can replicate data between our, our on-prem and the managed cloud? So in the case where you're rolling your own, you have your own, and then you want to integrate with a managed cr Correct. Also. Uh, can you want to talk about like how? Yeah. You um, are, you, are you talking about a private, like private cloud to private cloud, or private cloud to public cloud? Uh, private to public. Yeah, so it, um, it's basically at API level, so you could use some of the same tools. Um, um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of customers who do that, they, um, what they do is they use something like, basically like Ansible um, that basically kind of abstracts a lot of the uh, differences and they basically say, hey, spin up a VM um, and then they just point to, to where, which cloud it's gonna be. Um, it is a little, tr it's still a little tricky to be honest. Like th some of the APIs are different <laughs> and, um, and the, um, the fe like Keystone Federation, the identity management in authorization, it's still fairly new so um, it can be done, but there's going to be some work involved. It's, it's not going to be a simple point and click. Yeah, and as far as uh, network connectivity goes, we see a lot of people doing like an IPsec, v IPsec VPN or something between them. Uh, and if you're using uh, VLAN networks on your, uh, your own OpenStack, uh, it's then fairly easy to have like a, a firewall slash uh, VPN device in front that uh, takes that and connects that up to what you have in Rackspace or SoftLayer or wherever you have your other infrastructure. And then you kind of get sort of layer two, layer three connectivity between them, even though it's obviously uh, VPNing across the internet. And of course, some of the providers have like a direct connect and stuff like that, but that tends to get really pricey mm -hmm. and isn't really necessary for most use cases. Thanks. Um, uh, so, the, so the next area we wanted to talk about this is as we go through it, I think the, f the first place is to start is, is talking about that. And, and can you mention if someone does DIY, one of the reasons is they want to modify it for some specific, very specific use case. So it gets into the conversation of stability versus capability, um, right? So if you're, any change you make to OpenStack off of the defaults, if you will, brings bring some costs. So I don't know, Paul, do you want to talk about like what it was like, say, carrying a patch, like what what that looks like? Yeah, so as soon as you start like uh, changing stuff from the uh, upstream OpenStack, uh, it, depending on how you've done the install, if you're installing from source or you're building your own packages, uh, it's a little bit easier than if you're doing a distribution. Uh, if you're coming from a distribution, you kind of have to modify bits from underneath the packages that the di distribution gave you. And then you can end up in a weird fight where the distribution is trying to like fix the RPM that you've changed code out from under and you're trying to keep it the same. And then um, you kind of get into that sort of constant fight with them. And then if you're following any of the like uh, the uh, the Red Hat like Stig compliance, it's very specific about anything that you get from a package doesn't, doesn't get changed apart from config files. Technically, you're, you're sort of losing some of your Stig compliance there, which for some people is a problem, some, some people isn't. Um, and then even if you're building your own packages or going from source, you kind of have that problem where you now have either a fork of Nova or you doing something you know, mid-install to apply a patch to it or whatever, and you've got to carry that. And then you've got to, like, any time you're looking at bringing down uh, new Nova code, uh, whether there's a new OpenStack version or you want to get newer features, you know, mid-version, you're kind of having to reapply those patches, make sure they all work, and often, you, you, you may find, a, you may experience a bug that you weren't expecting like three months after you did it because of some weird edge case you just hit. And so you can get, certainly get into a lot of uh, issues where you spend a lot of time troubleshooting uh, issues and whatnot. Yeah, I, I, the people who I find have done DIY successfully um, tend to be people who, uh, whether the operators actually also have some development background and really know Python and because you do have to uh, do stuff like get into the code, get into the database. Um, it's not for someone, you, you have to have very strong Linux skills to even have a shot at making this work um, at any kind of scale. So. Now, um, you know, you mentioned like as, as version change and, and upgrades, right? So, so that's always a problem, right? So, hey, day one, we can deploy this OpenStack or whatever, that's cool, but then the, the ongoing piece, um, if you're doing what, so if you're doing one of the managed options, that's generally taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Um, so, so that's one of those things that you're trading off that you would have to normally take care of yourself. 
um, if you're doing DIY, and at least with a distro, you're someone's testing the packages, like you said, and if you're not modifying them, it's a pretty understood process, usually. <laughs> uh, um, but, but from a, what does it look like if you're, if you're doing manage? Like, is it right away? Like, what's the, the, the delay? Yeah, so um, I'll speak for Rackspace and then you can talk about IBM. It, it, the, way we the way we do it is um, basically uh, when, when we have a new version, um, we basically work with the customer and say we need um, some kind of a, a window to do the upgrade. And then we basic, um, and w we rely on the customer to um, basically handle whatever needs to be done on the application layer and the VM layer. And then we, uh, once they give us OK, we just go ahead and, uh, and do the upgrades from one version to the other at the in open stack layer. But it's a, it's a shared responsibility, right? Because we don't have responsibility for the application layer. Yeah, we're fairly similar on uh, the Bluemix private cloud. Uh, one thing we do uh, is we build our own packages and we don't version them in the standard way that your distro packages version. So we can have two versions of Nova or six versions mm -hmm. of Nova on, on the same machine. So it's kind of when we want to upgrade Nova, say API, basically at the upgrade step, we're flipping a symlink and restarting a service rather than doing a, an RPM upgrade or, or an apt uh, upgrade and having to like remove bits, re-add bits. And so it tends to be uh, a, a lot smoother process. So most of our upgrades are, uh, are in place and have very little effect on the uh, customer and their workload, unless of course you're rebooting for a kernel up update or something like that, in which case we'll coordinate with the customer and make sure that their uh, yeah. workloads are in a safe place to, if need be, restarted or migrated to another machine and roll through or whatever the appropriate uh, method is for that given customer. Yeah, and, and some, there are some uh, managed providers, uh, like 5.9, uh, there may be others, they actually uh, do a blue-green uh, blue deployment of the OpenStack control plane. And they do that because they, actually, um, they run OpenStack in AWS, not on-premise. So they can just spin up another OpenStack and then just move everybody over. <laughs> to the new, so that's that's just different ways. But the uh, the main the thing that's the same about all of them is they're trying to make it as hands free for the customer as humanly possible. We have a question. Yeah, in the managed versus, uh, or in addition to distro specific, yeah. how easy is it to select from the full like menu of OpenStack components to swap out uh, different things? Have you found that most people have chosen? kind of the path that they want to go on, and that's what they offer. You mean from a which projects or versions of projects, or uh, both? More like for components that are easily swappable, and there's multiple solutions. So uh, you mean like the Cinder driver options and yeah, stuff like, like that? Yeah, like the various SDNs oh, yeah, and whatnot. Right. SDNs, yeah. yeah, so I think it, it depends. Uh, with, with Bluemix Private Cloud, we're very prescriptive, um, and we basically provide you know the entire BOM from uh, network switches down, and uh, we say we, we, we are Linux Bridge with VXLAN, we are Cinder with Ceph backed, uh, etc. So we, we're super prescriptive of, about that. Um, whereas I think Rackspace and some others maybe uh, have a little bit uh, looser and give more no, options. Not really. <laughs> oh. So uh, we talk, I talked about uh, one of the primary reasons for DIY is because you want to be able to customize things. And you can sort of do that because no one else will consume this open stack except you. If you're a distro or managed service, uh, especially, and especially if you're a managed service provider, um, the worst possible thing you could do is to manage 100 snowflakes, right? So, because you know, that doesn't work at scale. So the, the way we kind of get around that is basically give you a very opinionated uh, approach to OpenStack. So Rackspace, for example, uh, currently supports eight projects. Um, and we basically say, unless, a pro unless we feel a project can um, satisfy, is production ready for 80 to 90% of our customers, we're not gonna roll it in. Because if we have to manage, a f and I won't name those projects, but if we have to manage a few of these projects at 10 customers, um, then it's, that takes away from our ability to manage the whole fleet of customers that we have. And, and I think it's that prescriptiveness that makes, that gives us the ability to do upgrades mm -hmm. uh, in a very reliable, resilient manner. Um, I know we certainly do upgrades um, like frequently through the year, we're, when, when we roll out uh, the new release of, uh, of our product, we're immediately upgrading uh, our production customers. Um, so we're, 
it's very rare for a customer to be lagging a version behind after, say, three or four months after we've got a new version. So, if, so that's, that's one of those decision points then, right? So if you're, if you're a customer and you say, we need, I'll just pick a project, we need Trove, right? For, for our use case, we want Trove. And if it's not included in your offering, generally it's, you're not, you're not getting it. So that's when you'd have to go to a distro or DIY. Yeah, that's right. And even with the distros, they only support a, 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 a small sort of group of, of the projects. Um, yeah. I think some may support Trove, some don't, some support, um, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but like some may support Ironic, some don't. So if you have very specific, very deep needs in some of those uh, newer projects or lesser used projects, you may end, end up needing to DIY or you may need to just DIY that particular piece. Like you could bring your own Ironic and tie it into a, a, the Red Hat distro. Uh, you may have some support issues with Red Hat and have to figure that out, but in theory it could be done if you wanted to. But usually if you're that have that specific use case, you are going to DIY. Yeah, I think specifically also if it's the type of project where it kind of just consumes the other OpenStack services versus like, hey, it has an agent that goes on, on the you know on the nodes and all that kind of stuff, it's even easier to just drop that on top. Yeah, that's right. We actually had, uh, before we supported Heat in Bluemix Private Cloud, we actually had some customers that were running their own Heat and just connecting it up to our APIs, and that uh, that worked quite well for them. Question? Yeah. Um, how does this... Con can you compare and contrast uh, the impact that each of these consumption models have in data compliance, data governments, and you know, data sovereignty? Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a, good, that's a good question there from the standpoint of we talked about the models, we didn't also mention where they could be located, right? So I think a DIY is pretty obvious, it's, it's up to you, wherever you want to run it, you can run it. Um, and same thing with distro, right? If I, if I have uh, you know, Red Hat OpenStack, uh, uh, pop the you know, ISO image in, I can pretty much run it wherever. What about the managed options? Well, yeah, so um, managed, I guess if it's in, because uh, some managed options are in your data center, some are in the, the, uh, the I guess the company you're getting managing it, it's, it's in their data center. Um, but the, the hardware is dedicated to you. Um, so even if it's in the managed data center, it's still like a, you know, it's, it's, still, it's still yours. And so I think from a data sovereign point of view, that sort of covers most cases. Um, and then from a, there was a bit of compliance mention there, and I know both, uh, uh, Bluemix and Rackspace uh, doing a lot of work around compliance and uh, meeting the, the, the STIG stuff. Um, there's been a lot of work in OpenStack Ansible uh, and then also in uh, uh, Bluemix's tool Ursula to uh, support that uh, and then to even do reporting back to it. In uh, Bluemix we actually, uh, we, we get alerted by our monitoring systems if a system comes out of compliance for STIG. So we can, uh, we can react to that uh, very quickly and uh, fix whatever it was that caused it to uh, go out of compliance. Yeah, I, I think one thing, the, the kind of the balance is, if you're doing your own and you have the right people to, to do that, you can probably move faster <laughs> uh, than a distro vendor or management in terms of supporting all the various different compliance rules, right? Because you can, you can basically custom fit this platform to meet that particular compliance requirements. Uh, for distros and managed service providers, because we're trying to we're trying to meet the needs of many more customers. Things will always move a little slower. Now, the, the flip side is uh, do DIY, you have to provide all the resources to do that. If you're IBM or Cisco or Rackspace, we can bring in other teams right? that can, uh, can, that can help provide some of that compliance uh, needs that you have. So, so it's kind of, you got there's some trade-offs, so you got to figure out um, how much you want to take control of your own destiny um, one thing I tell people who do DIY is um, you've now become a software company because you are now the product manager uh, for your own product. It's, um, and you have to do all the things that a product, man the product team has to do to manage the life cycle. Any question over here? Yes, yeah, so um, as you mentioned, you know, in managed or various consumption models besides DIY, you have an opinionated stack potentially or a set of services. Um, besides, you know, customer demand, how do you gauge the readiness of a service in terms of maturity? Like when, when do you decide or how do you decide that, yeah, I think we're comfortable putting this one in now? Uh, so from a Bluemix perspective, uh, we, we try and make it uh, customer driven, but we will bring in like early support for uh, a project into our uh, install base, but we may not actually install it for our customers. And that way we can have it in our test clouds and do a lot more rigorous testing. So 
if you look at our, uh, our installer, you might see roles for uh, uh, Ironic and roles for Magnum and some other projects, but we don't actually support those in our product. Um, we just have them there so that we can be installing them in our, in our own test clouds and be testing them out and trying to gauge uh, how they're at from a, not just are they production ready, but are they easy to use? Do, do we have to teach the customers how to build us like a special, uh, a special image for Magnum or for Trove or whatever else? So there's a lot of other considerations other than just, you know, is the project ready? So I'm going to say something that probably come across as negative. It probably is. Um, <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is when people, when the OpenStack projects get rolled out, depending on the project, uh, there's sometimes not a lot of concern about whether this is something that can be easily monitor or manage or troubleshoot, right? It's more about, I got a new feature, I'm going to get it out. So um, one of the things any of the managed providers, particularly managed providers, distros to some extent is, as well, is we have to pick projects that you can actually manage, <laughs> right? That will actually scale, right? It, 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 the uh, the open, OpenStack uh, community may roll out a project and call it ready, when it works on five nodes, but we actually have to be concerned whether it works across 100 nodes. Um, so that's why things will always take a little longer because we're making sure, again, making sure that it's upgradable, it's, um, it's you can actually monitor it, you can actually troubleshoot it in, in a way that um, minimizes customer downtime. Yeah, and, and, and there's, I think on the distro side, there's no specific formula that you punch in if it has this many, you know, selections in the user survey plus this plus this equals we're going to support that um, some of it is it's it's technical readiness um, but a lot of it is driven by customer demand so it's like customers really want this project and they're really looking for it um, that I mean like most product management right that's that's what is the main driver of uh, supporting new projects question okay thank you um, another uh, operational challenge that that we face I imagine that we already have a, a new deployment. Mm -hmm. um, is there a maturity model so we can grow in a roadmap in, in a controlled fashion for for um, for uh, for deploying new projects or adding new 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 services into the service yeah. catalog? I think yeah, so you gave a talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So there, yeah. There's a um, the the nice thing about this is there's. Everyone's different, right? So what, what may be ready for you know this person's cloud, you would not consider ready, and you're looking for more things. So uh, what the OpenStack Foundation has created a thing called the Project Navigator. So if you go to the OpenStack site, there's a Project Navigator, and it gives a lot of uh, statistics across all the projects. So it'll show you um, number of you know contributors, you know if they meet regularly, you know are they meeting the release cycles? Have they checked? There's all the different boxes, so then you can decide. Does this project meet your personal um, your personal readiness test? And then you can also keep an eye on projects to say, hey, we don't think that project's ready yet for us, but that can help you plan to say, hey, we want to add say Magnum later, but these are the areas where we think it's deficient. And if it's a say a feature like say rolling upgrades aren't supported, um, that may be some feedback you even want to give to the project to say, hey, we'd love to run your project, but until you support this, we can't really use it. And that's where the user feedback can come to the projects to say. Um, hey, we need this, and and kind of on that note, that's where kind of how your methodology, how you're deployed, comes in too. So, if you're doing DIY, like guess what, log into the IRC meetings and and, and voice your opinion. Um, if you're do going through a distro vendor, you probably your easiest avenue is go to the vendor and say, hey, we 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 need this, but it doesn't support that. When are you going to support it? Can you push it upstream? You know have that customer feedback. And then I think on the same thing on the managed side is like, hey, we, we'd really love to use this on your service. And then they have the appropriate upstream resources to either make that voice known or even the actual developers to, to contribute to, to get it over that hurdle. Yeah, I think if you're DIY, don't choose a project solely based on whether it has a feature that you think it's good. Um, it's really important to see how many people actually contributed and when was the last time they rolled out a patch. Uh, because otherwise, you may end up leading the project unintentionally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, speaking of that, on on the kind of the upgrades, and then even which projects and stuff like that, we talked about packaging, right? So uh, obviously, d distribution vendors make packages, and it's part of the deal, right? So if I have a uh, you know Red Hat Linux box, I can you know yum install packages and new versions of Nova and things like that. Um, what are the other ways you can get packages? I don't know, Paul, you kind of mentioned earlier. 
Yeah, so uh, for uh, Bluemix Private Cloud, uh, for a long time we were de uh, deploying from source, um, and we would basically pin the versions at the, the Git char of the version that we wanted. Uh, and that, that worked fine, but it wasn't very deterministic because while you're pinning Nova at a very specific version, upstream dependencies could change and that would, could cause all sorts of issues. So we built a project called Gifrap, which would basically, you would tell it what versions you wanted and it would go and collect all the dependencies and build uh, either deb files or RPMs or I think we support Docker images in that tool as well. And that way you've, always, you've got that very specific deployable artifact that's always the same versus is mostly the same. Uh, and that, that definitely helped improve our like, longer term stability and predictability when we did that. Yeah, so in the DIY mode, um, you would even still want to be building packages at that point, right? You know, you're not just doing a, a, a git pull <laughs> and restarting services or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with doing a, a git pull. And I guess if you were using a, a newer project that's changing uh, more frequently, maybe going directly from source is a good idea. But for the more stable stuff, uh, you know, Nova, Neutron, et cetera, I, I really think it's a good idea to be building packages. Uh, even if you don't want to go all the way to a .deb file, you can build it into a, a Python wheel or, you know, there's, there's a few other options. Uh, build it into a virtual env and tarball up that virtual env, uh, you know, anything in that sort of realm. Yeah, and I was like, on, on uh, our public cloud, we, we actually took a different approach on our public cloud versus our private cloud. So on our public cloud, we're actually pulling from source all the time. Um, we're at, our goal is always to be, our goal is to be no uh, more than two weeks behind the l absolute latest release. Um, uh, frequently we fall behind more than that. But um, I can tell you that's not something that, um, I'll, my experience is that's not something that a lot of companies are willing, ready to handle. You really have to um, know what you're doing because you can really screw up something very badly. Uh, on the private cloud side, because um, we're working with customers that tend not to have that need to be on the bleeding edge. Um, we actually just take the community release uh, when it comes out, and then we basically um, uh, put it in, uh, use Ansible playbooks to deploy. So there's a we have a project called OpenStack Ansible. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, when you deploy OpenStack Ansible, you're essentially deploying Rackspace's reference architecture for a private OpenStack private cloud. Um, yeah, I think I think one of the other things that we're kind of talking about here too is upstream, right? So if you're not familiar, right, upstream will, is the actual OpenStack code that's being developed on, um, and obviously as a distribution, we we pull those at the releases, similar to you described Red Hat uh, with um, with Rackspace, and we you know package it up and test it and those types of things. Um, and we talked earlier about uh, like carrying patches and stuff. So one of the options is, hey, we're DIY. OpenStack doesn't do a thing exactly how we want, so we're going to patch it, and then we're going to have to carry that patch constantly between versions and test it and things like that. One of the other options is to just contribute that code upstream. You know, de depending if it's something the community wants, it's it's a normal thing. It's not something weird. Um, getting stuff upstream is preferable, right? Yeah, that's right. But there there can be a significant lag. Um, we have, you know put features up or bugs up and had, you know, a six to 12 month lag on getting them uh, into uh, in, into master and then pushed to like stable Mataka or whatever the stable version is right now. Uh, and so it's not unusual for us to briefly uh, fork stable Mataka or stable Newton, uh, add our patches in there and then jump back off that fork once the uh, uh, they've caught back up. Uh, and same with uh, features, uh, occasionally we have, you know, things we need for like our own internal compliance around password complexity and stuff that uh, may not be supported upstream, that upstream may not want to support. And so then we have to make a call there if we're forking the code or we're gonna inject some middleware somewhere or something like that. Yeah, um, we, so you know, one of the challenges of doing all this too is um, sometimes people don't realize um, uh, th there's a whole process involved in getting a patch or, or new code actually into and approved. Um, and so uh, we've had customers that come to us and say, we try to do it ourselves and we haven't been able to get a single patch through for, because we're missing this or that and the other. And they actually rely on us to kind of help them push it through because we have so much experience in doing that. Um, so, and Rackspace also uh, supports Red Hat's OpenStack distro. And another one, one of the things they do is they 
um, they have like a like a long term release and then the, uh, kind of the shorter term release. So on the uh, short term release, you're, you're basically getting code. Um, every release of OpenStack, there's going to be a release you can use. On a longer term release, they may stick with something like um, Metaka uh, and say you can you can run Metaka for three years or two I think two years, two to three years. And what they'll do is if there are patches that are in a new release, that's not, you know, what they'll do is instead of making you upgrade to Okada, um, they'll backport those uh, fixes into their uh, distribution of uh, Metaka. Yeah, and yeah. there's even some work in the OpenStack community for stable branch maintenance to, for, because all the distro vendors do that, right? That's a pretty common thing to have a long term release model and then have to backport patches. So try and get some of the, the, the dis distribution vendors to collaborate to, to, to not everyone repeat the same work for backporting patches. Fr from a, a DIY or managed perspective, uh, one of the advantages is you do get the option to patch a lot sooner. So if there's a, a security vulnerability that comes out, you can patch like same day. Whereas if you're uh, coming from a distro, really you want to be getting them to update their packages and then up updating from their packages versus getting out from underneath them and again, you know, changing code from underneath their packages which can, as I said earlier, get pretty hairy. Yeah, yeah, and that's why even in those cases, we try like, say there's a new CVE or something like that comes out that even, like say, Red Hat, where a distro vendor may re release their own patch or, you know, as a, as a you know, initial thing and then rev the package or, or something like that. So the costs of that from a supportability perspective and then a people perspective can, can get high if you're, if you're not aware that if you're doing, if you're doing DIY. A question? Yeah, I want to get all of the uh, three of you to talk about backup, not replication, because that's not backup, but yeah. from a, but, but what's your guys' strategy from dealing with, was the, whether it's malware or, or, or some sort of like ransomware to a rogue sysadmin to even I want to restore my environment from a day ago, whether that's a VM or, you know, some, some Nova compute or, or, some, or, or, or maybe some data to, to entire infrastructure in a DR case. Yeah, so fr from our perspective, we don't really have a ton to back up from the, uh, from the underlying uh, systems itself because we have, obviously we have the, the databases, uh, but like the Rabbit doesn't really have any stateful data. Um, from the VM perspective, uh, we, we allow our customers to choose however they want to back it up. We don't, we don't force them to back up. We don't force a particular method to back up because everyone, wa everyone already has their own method to do backups and stuff, so we kind of leave that to the customer. So we have, we have a few things on the, on the controller and the compute nodes that we have to back up. We have a few con config pieces and stuff we need to back up, but a lot of that is e kind of backed up in our uh, config management code anyway. So there's not a ton that we need to do, and then we help work with the customer to give them you know, connectivity to, from their backup software to us via you know, a VPN or whatever, whatever else they need and help sort of assist them figure out the best way to back up, but uh, we, we don't uh, back up for our customers. Yeah, so I, I think it's similar theme as I, um, for all the managed providers is, uh, in distros is we kind of let the customer choose how they want to um, do some, how they want to back up the VM level. Um, obviously again, like I said earlier, if you go with a vendor, they may have other resources that, that that's an option, but it's not going to be mandated. So an example is in, uh, with Rackspace is um, because we have a, a very large public OpenStack public cloud with Swift, um, we have customers that basically snap images <laughs> and throw them into um, our Swift uh, or cloud, what we call the cloud files implementation. Um, we have a, we are also a very big Commvault partner. So I'm not and I'm not necessarily saying Commvault is the best solution for backing up OpenStack uh, VMs. It's, what Rackspace has, and so can customers choose to do that. But at the end of the day, we'll, we'll offer some resources, but it's up to the customer to choose which res which method works. Yeah, and I think maybe for the the like the larger IBM corporation, the larger Rackspace corporation, there are parts of the org that will do backups for you, partnering with us and whatnot as well. But just us as the the OpenStack team, we 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 punt on that to the customer or to. Uh, our partners inside our own companies to work with that customer. Yeah, and one other thing too is like some of the discussion about backup is actually, um, uh, I'd say relatively recent, because I think if you kind of go back to the history of OpenStack, there were some assumptions that you would never need to back up your VM. 
right? Because they're completely stateless. Um, and so I don't think, uh, to be honest, no one really thought about how you would want to back up VMs because the thought was you, you don't want to back, or you don't need to back up VMs. I think that discussion has, started ch has been changing some uh, with more enterprise customers who are trying to run more stateful workloads. Uh, but that's still a work in progress. It's still very far behind, say, Nova or, or yeah. Neutron. Yeah, I would say the, the same thing as far as, yeah, there's some things even with Glance, like snapping VMs and things like that. But I think most enterprises have something else for backups, and they're leveraging it to backup the databases and, and the instances and things like that, um, both from a workflow perspective, and it's probably it's more advanced than what's kind of native to OpenStack right now. Uh, we're li we're just about done, and we don't. If we have any other, someone wants to hop up with a question, um, go ahead. You again? Does someone else want to ask a question? Save two games. No, so question. So you know, obviously, you provide different options to manage. You have distros. You have you know, you can do it yourself. But I'm curious, like, why as a provider of OpenStack, if you're doing managed, why don't you make your code a distro as well, so you can support the maximum spectrum of customers. Like, why, why is there like people are either managed or distro, and there might be some that are both, but not many. Well, I think it's, it's hard to do both because you're focusing at a different level. Like at the, at the managed level, you're really focusing on the stability and the operability, um, whereas as a distribution, you're also, you, it, it's more, you're also thinking about the distribution and packaging and other things, so you kind of, two completely, two fairly separate businesses, and there's no reason a large enough managed provider couldn't do both, but I, I, I guess it just depends on uh, what they're doing. Yeah, and I, um, I think we, one of the reasons um, w a lot of, I think uh, a lot of the providers now are actually using a distro as their OpenStack layer within the managed service, and I think it's, it's, it's a callback to what, um, you know, what Paul is saying. It's, for most, and I'll say this for Rackspace, our core competency isn't building distros <laughs> for packages. Our core competency is building all the other services, like monitoring and, 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 uh, op and upgrades and operations around uh, OpenStack. So it w we don't really want to try to do both at the same time possible. Yeah, and if, if you're a Red Hat customer, you don't want my distribution, you don't want his distribution, you want, you want Red Hat, right? So it's better for us to work with Red Hat and provide uh, Red Hat OpenStack platform as an option for our, our managed, and I think uh, both uh, Rackspace and IBM actually do, do offer that. Can you, can you say Red Hat one more time? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> canonical? <laughs> there we go. Question over here. Yeah. Um, when would someone choose uh, to go managed to private cloud versus like a public cloud? What are the vagaries between the two? So that's, that's tough and it's really up to the individual customer. Some of it's about uh, predictability of costs, it's about uh, capacity planning, it can be about data sovereignty. Um, com yeah, I mean com comfortable, like whether they're comfortable using Amazon, like Walmart's a perfect example, right? Amazon's a competitor so they don't wanna use Amazon. They could go to GCE or something else, I guess, but. Uh, yeah, the, th the three that I most frequently hear talking with customers is, um, predictable costs. Um, uh, most managed, I'm not sure how IBM or Cisco does it. Uh, I think uh, Raxic, for example, we don't, um, we, ch we basically, we don't charge, it's not an on-demand VM price. We basically charge by the compute node on a monthly basis. And we don't, you can spin up a thousand VMs on that node, or you can spin up 10. We don't care, it's the same price. So that's a predictable cost no matter how many VMs you use. Uh, second reason is single tenant. Um, you just don't want, you know, for data, com for compliance reasons sometimes, customers don't want to share hardware with, uh, with other customers. And then the third thing is, um, uh, in some cases, um, avoiding the noisy neighbor. So we've had customers who were running in some public cloud and they've had performance issues because they're sharing that, again, they're sharing bandwidth and hardware with that customer. So they went to our private cloud because they can, again, predictable performance. Yeah, and even uh, for the noisy neighbor perspective, even like inside their own customer, um, because it's a, it's a private cloud and we manage it for them, we can help set up mm -hmm. availability groups and stuff like that so that like some groups will go to their own hardware if they have very specific needs or you know, one group has GPUs and they don't want anyone else using their GPUs because they cost so much and we can kind of help, uh, help out with that. Um, 
w one last thing, you know, before we run out of time, I want to cover is the the decision making process, right? So, how do you decide which of these makes sense for you? Do you have any quick tips for you? Know, do Do you want OpenStack to be your business's core competency? If not, have someone help you do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 on that note, the, the foundation's been trying to help there as well, help people kind of navigate this. So uh, there's been a number of publications. Uh, and if right now, if you go to openstack.org slash enterprise, there's a couple different eBooks. I think there's some physical copies here in the foundation lounge. Um, help you make those decisions of which operational model you want to choose. Cover some of the things we talked about. Uh, so you can pick out what makes sense. Maybe you want to change. You know, you're doing one way, and you're like, hey, actually, now that we're looking at this, we, we don't want to do this. Um, so there's lots of good resources to help you decide which, which way makes sense. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>